a region of the minority steeped in national history where the lifeblood of the national economy attracts diverse peoples and interests from across the country and around the globe. It is here in Nigeria's bustling Niger Delta region that we observe and incisively diarize life and activity in this fast expanding region facing peculiar human and socio-economic challenges. We assess local industry, we hear directly from the people affected by decisions, and we question the decision makers empowered to serve and protect them. I am Ajuri Ngilale, and it is my honor to present to you a diary from the Delta, exclusively on AIT. Here I am at Adokie Amisamaka Stadium in Port Harcourt. As you can see, the stadium is still very much under construction, but I'm not here to talk about the stadium. I'm here to talk about the potentials of a hidden treasure surrounding it. What if I were to tell you that a stone just like this one could underwrite the future of the Niger Delta's economy and beyond? I am. Ajuri Ngilale, and I assess the potentials of solid mineral development in the region in this entry in my diary from the Delta. Like most of Nigeria's development challenges, the solutions to problems in the nation's solid mineral sector are known and available, but require time, comprehensive planning, and diligent implementation after decades of neglect. In looking ahead, one must look back to understand the journey forward. The discovery of oil in 1956 and the well-documented neglect of the non-oil sectors was accompanied by the formation of the Nigerian Mining and Coal Corporation as a byproduct of Nigeria's indigenization decree of 1972. This policy thrust, which had actively discouraged foreign technical inputs and mining operations to open the sector for the exclusive patronage of indigenous operators, had coincided with the emergence of new bureaucracy in the sector, which performed poorly. While a history of neglect and decay in the sector has continued up until recent years, the enactment of the Nigerian Minerals and Mining Act of 2007 was an important milestone on the road to reform in the sector. And even as this reform legislation is deep and comprehensive in its composition, its implementation has been non-starting in recent years. The Minister of Solid Minerals, Kayode Fayemi, attributes this reality to the non-availability of reliable and accurate geological data. Well, primarily, this is a sector that has been underfunded for a long time. But this is a sector that also requires a lot more in terms of preparation for investment. Everybody talks about how well endowed Nigeria is. Everywhere you go, people say, oh, we have solid minerals, we have this. But what they don't say, and what they don't know, and what we ourselves don't know is the quantity, the quality, the commercial value of what we possess. And that process started with my predecessors when the Airborne Geophysical Survey was done. And that gives an indicative sense of what is available in the country based on the rock formation and the sedimentology and all that. But it doesn't quite give an accurate sense that is bankable for an average investor 
who wants to come into the sector. And one critical area in which we want to spend money is geophysical, geosciences, data generation. So our geological surveys agency would take a chunk of that money to conduct all these exploratory exercises, because that's the key. I highlighted a, a few minerals. We have somewhere in the region about 44 minerals that are there in varying quantities and quality. But I highlighted seven that I said are of commercial quantity and quality potential that we can work on. I talked about bitumen, I talked about barite, I talked about gold, I talked about coal, I talked about iron ore and limestone. These are there, we know, in abundance, and they're already being mined. I mean, Ashaka cement, Dangote cement, Dua, they are all on the field mining limestone. Mining is an equal opportunities uh, area. Unlike oil, virtually every state in this country has something. We just need to do a lot more work to find out the quantity and quality of what they have. Zamfara, Niger, down to Oshun. That is the gold belt of Nigeria. And if you look at that gold belt, it's on the same geographical axis as you find in Ghana. And I've argued that if this much gold has been discovered in Ghana and it has been mined, we're a green field. We have not even been touched. And that is why this exploration is so critical to us. Of the 9.1 billion naira appropriated for capital expenditure in the 2016 federal budget allocation of the Ministry of Solid Minerals, the bulk of the funding will be spent on a new 24-month geological survey needed to update the nation's outdated geological data, which will be used to assess the quantity and quality of Nigeria's solid mineral deposits since the last geo survey was conducted in the 1970s. The Fraser Institute's Global Mining Survey has ranked Nigeria 114th out of 122 mining countries in mining investment attractiveness. This indication of low investor confidence comes as a direct result of unreliable geological data, poor policy judgment and consistency, inadequate associated transport infrastructure, epileptic power supply, as well as insufficient public funding and private borrowing mechanisms in the sector. The solid mineral sector's 0.34% contribution to GDP is reflective of the less than 1% rate of exposure to the solid mineral sector in the total public financing portfolio of the Nigerian banking sector. With these challenges in mind, many opportunities present themselves in the form of potential solutions. In the Niger Delta, the oil and gas industry is heavily reliant on clays, metals, and other solid minerals for its operations. And while liquid minerals are being exploited in the region, the Niger Delta's abundant reserve of strategic clays and solid minerals are being left dormant. This is particularly of concern when understanding that all-inclusive growth demands for entirely internal solutions to internal problems, both regionally and nationally. For example, when oil companies drill into the earth to create new wells for production, a non-metallic mineral known as barite is used in large quantities as a weighting agent in drilling mud as it contains unique gravitational qualities to facilitate drilling in high-density subsurfaces. The Niger Delta is rich in barite deposits, yet the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, and other oil companies operating in the region import massive quantities of barite from Morocco to conduct operations in the Niger Delta, where the solid minerals remain untapped. Aside from the loss of foreign exchange and solid mineral export opportunities, 
The secondary industries supported by this one mineral, such as rubber, cloth, and paper production, yield billions worth of foreign exchange outside of the region and indeed beyond the nation's borders. Can the federal government effectively work across party lines with state governments in the Niger Delta and vice versa in substituting wasteful imports with local content while expanding economic opportunity for the people of the region? This is just one isolated example which is indicative of the need to expedite the process of import substitution across sectors, but particularly in the solid mineral sector. The granite on this floor in my office that you, you're sitting in is from Nigeria. It's not from China. It's not from Italy. It is polished here. It is caught here, and that's a segment that we haven't fully utilized. In limestone, we've almost attained 100% local production, and we even have some capacity to export cement in this country now. That wasn't the case before. That's also a solid mineral. You have kaolin in abundance that we can turn around into producing ceramics. So it is in those areas where we spend avoidable foreign exchange that we can clamp down on that through policy and through support to the local industry in order for them to be able to generate the kind of resources you're talking about. Two, we already have tax holidays for majors and mid-tier miners who want to operate in the Nigerian mining sector. We also have waiver in the Nigerian mining uh, regulatory regime for them to bring in the equipment. You know, mining equipment are quite specific. They, they can be quite expensive. So we have in the, in the law and in our regulation and policy opportunities for them to bring this in just with an approval by me as minister here. But we need to make sure that we do a lot more in coordinating with other ministries on the regulatory regime implementation. Because there can be confusion sometimes. Some of the things that we have here in Nigeria, we also give waiver to some companies to bring it in to the country. Replacing solid mineral imports with local alternatives is just one policy imperative but constructing entirely new regulatory enforcement and revenue tracking architecture is a completely different challenge. One area in which revenues can quickly be realized is in the blockage of leakages in the sector. In the 2016 budget, just over 700 million naira has been allocated to establish an automated database of all mining licensees, time frames, production capacity, revenues accruable, and taxes generated by each operator in the Mining Cadaster Office. The Nigerian Minerals and Mining Act of 2007 also provides a use-it-or-lose-it clause which threatens mining licensees with the loss of access if there is a lack of verifiable productivity or non-compliance with safety and other industrial standards. Working with the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps to arrest illegal mining activities, the minister says all enforcement mechanisms are supported with the requisite political will to bite hard. We can plug leakages. There's a lot of leakages in royalty collection, in tax payment, in this sector. Our quarries, our mining operations are not optimally tax. And I'm not talking about increasing taxes. I'm talking about even collecting the legitimate taxes that are due and royalties on current operations. Mining leases and licenses, which needs cleaning up. I already indicated that we will give people an amnesty period of about two months to regularize whatever they ought to regularize. When you take a mining license, or an exploratory license, you must submit a work plan indicating what you're going to do in the period for which the license is valid. But we haven't done enough due to 
capacity challenges in monitoring how well people have adhered strictly to the conditions in the Mining and Minerals Act. And that's why I talked about really, really enforcing the use or lose clause. You, the, the choice is clear. You have to explain to us if you have taken a license that says you have three years to undertake your exploration activities in order to then get uh, a proper mining lease. You need to be able to demonstrate to us that you've taken steps that are independently verifiable in the course of accomplishing what you claim you want to do. If you are not able to do that, and you have not been able to provide us with justifiable reason why you haven't been able to do that, then it stands to reason that you're just keeping that license, blocking further investments from taking place from people who are more serious minded. Oil and gas pollution rightfully takes the headlines, but environmental abuse is not geographically exclusive to the Niger Delta. Solid mineral exploitation has for many years brought similar suffering and tragedy to the nation's mineral-rich north. Stringent enforcement standards will prove to be a necessity at a time when organized illegal mining cabals import their operations from China. China's state-sponsored mining operatives conspire with local and state government officials in mineral-rich states to illegally mine local endowments at the expense of rural dwellers in northern states such as Zamfara State, where gold deposits serve as a point of intense interest. Reports from the Nigerian Senate disclosed that Nigeria is losing an average of 4 trillion naira, or $20 billion yearly, to illegal mining activity in the north. While Nigeria's raw minerals and, by extension, billions of dollars in foreign exchange is lost to other nations, the devastating impact of artisanal mining is left behind and felt by local populations. Motivated by the fact that illegal gold mining offers them approximately ten times the agro-farming income they once lived on, local artisanal miners and their young children are employed by foreign interest groups to mine in harsh and toxic conditions. Hundreds of Nigerian children die each year in northern states from lead poisoning due to deplorable illegal mining practices. As artisanal miners crush massive lead-filled stones in search of tiny deposits of gold, lead particles fill the air and subsequently the developing internal organs of children, leading to mental retardation and, in many cases, death. Due to official neglect over the past decade, no steps have been taken to curb illegal mining, nor has there been any cleanup of lead-contaminated areas. Health worker Celestina Ngozi gives an account. Every evening, I enter the community. I enter their houses. I'm a woman. They will not tell me, don't come in. I enter their houses, I see their children, out of ten, five is sick, lying in the house, taking local medicine. And before you know it, the five will not survive. Nigeria's drive to industrialize is married to its capacity to revive moribund steel mining and production capacity. The Ajayokuta Steel Complex in Kogi State doubles as the federal government's non-returning $10 billion investment, which is central to efforts aimed at turning unnecessary import losses into export gains. Between 2010 and 2015, Nigeria has spent in excess of 10 trillion naira on the importation of steel products, not including losses from the absence of secondary industries requiring its availability locally. Aware of these unmet challenges, the Minister of Solid Minerals says state governments can now take advantage of partnerships with the federal government and the private sector to invest in mutually beneficial joint ventures to develop metals and other solid minerals in high demand along with other allied industries.
Federal plans to construct high-speed rail and road connections between key port cities and other regions of the country provide administrators in the zone with investment opportunities in industries that can support the development of the Niger Delta in preparation for life after oil. I believe that states are not utilizing the opportunity for joint venture initiatives enough. There is nothing that stops states from forming companies, their own investment corporation, if they think they have bankable assets in their state and that they can work with mid-tier mining operators or even big-time mining operators, local or uh, uh, international, in developing what is available in their state. And that's the partnership I've entered into with them. The solid mineral sector of 2016 is akin to the oil and gas sector of 1956. Depending on the discretion of Nigerian administrators, both promised boundless potential, opportunities for growth and broad-based prosperity, but also present is the potential for maladministration in addition to environmental and human rights abuses. Will the troubling history of the oil industry be retold in the later days of Nigeria's solid minerals development, or will it be a story of lessons learned and potential well actualized? The answer will surely come, but certainly the promise is not in doubt. I am Ajuri Ngilale signing off.